Hi, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. And thank you so much for utilizing this resource. Our hope for you and anything that we provide is that you would expect transformation, that we could demonstrate love towards you because of the love of God demonstrated to us, that you would have the faith stirred in you to deal with obstacles and to see opportunities, and that ultimately that the kingdom of God would be revealed in every area of your life. And so our hope with this resource is that the Lord would speak to you powerfully. As we jump into Jeremiah 29, um, I, I think the question that's probably been hanging in the air while we've walked through this series is, the way you're talking about this, how am I supposed to engage with the, engage with the political moment? Do I just kind of back off and don't have anything to do with it? Or do I just kind of throw my hands up in resignation and be like, hey, this is the best that we got. I'm just going to have to do what I can do in this moment. And so I just want to talk a little bit about developing um, strength and balance. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I ran track. Many of you know that. I've, I've told those stories. I'm reliving the glory years in front of you. Um, but one of the things that happened is during my senior year of high school, uh, so when you run track, if, you ever hear some, if you're on a track and you ever hear somebody yell out the word track, that means they're running fast on the inside lane, get out of the inside lane. And so I was running and I was, I was yelling out track and there's a football player that was standing there and he wasn't moving. And so I yelled it a couple of times. And this was the height of the Bill Goldberg, Bill Goldberg era. So I was like, I'm sparing you, dude. Like it just is what it is. And so he wouldn't move and I tackled him and he grabbed the back of my arm. And when I hit the ground, it jarred my shoulder. So I, was, I already injured myself slightly, but it wasn't bad enough to stop doing my normal everyday things. I iced it a little bit, kind of kept going. And then a few weeks later, I was in the weight room, and I would like to tell you that I was committed to being the best, most explosive athlete I could possibly be, or I wanted to be an inspiration as a senior leader on our football team, and so I was pushing myself to the limit so that way my teammates would push themselves to the limit. None of those things were true. There was a girl that I thought that was cute that was in the gym at the same time. And so I was trying to do bench press, and I told one of my buddies, go ahead and put a plate on each side. And so I was moving it. Like that, that needs to be told in the story. Like it, was, like it wasn't stuck on my chest. Like it was starting to move, but I got stuck. And so then like, this is what you don't do. You don't like try and jerk through because if you do that, it doesn't work. And so I tried to jerk through and my right arm went and my left arm said, nope, you're not today, homie. And so I really hurt my shoulder get to the point where I could not lift my arm over my head. Like I could think during times of worship, like I looked like a wounded duck because one wing could fly and one was like this. And so it wasn't until my freshman year of college, I got to the University of Oklahoma uh, and I went to see the doctors there and they did x-rays and they're like, well, here's the good news. You did not tear your rotator cuff. And so our game plan instead of surgery is that we're going to strengthen your labrum. And so you're going to do a lot of physical therapy. And so I can remember going to physical therapy and, and as they would have me do different exercises, some of them made perfect sense. Like there was one where I'd have to sit with my elbow on a table and I would have a resistance band behind me and the goal was to pull forward and fight the resistance of it pulling back. And, and th- if you've ever had to go through physical, physical therapy, there's a level of shame when you start out when they're like, hey, here is floss because that's how strong your shoulder is. <laughs> Or like, I completely remember having to like hold like two pound weights and trying to lift my, my shoulder above my, or my, my hands above my head. And it was like, I, I can move more weight than this. But it was like, not, not at that point, not, not in that joint. And so most of the exercises that they had me do made perfect sense. But there was one exercise that they asked me to do where they got a BOSU ball and they asked me to stand on the BOSU ball. And then they gave me this thing that looked like it had white wiper blades on either side of it. And the goal was for me to shake this thing while keeping my balance. And I was like, what if I'm just uncoordinated? What if I'm not injured? What if I just can't do this? And they're like, the reality is that you've started to compensate with this injury and it's going to affect the rest of your body. And so you're going to have to learn how to, re- how to maintain balance to, to exert your strength. And so day after day at physical therapy, I'm having to do this thing where I'm trying to balance so I could use my strength and I hated it. And the reason that I bring that up is because there is a call of the people of God to use the power that he's given them in the world in which they exist, but we're going to have to figure out what balance is before we ever exude any of that strength. Like the, we can't lean too far into being a people of concession that just say, well, we're, when in Rome, do what the Romans do because it strips us of our power. But we also can't move to the back hills of Montana and say, we're going to start a commune and one of these days we're taking down the government. That's not an option either. And so for us to exude the strength that God has given us on our moment, we've got to figure out what, it is, what is it to be balanced and show our strength in the middle of the world that he's put us in. And so 
Here's our main idea. Followers of Jesus must find the balance between rebellion and concession as we seek the welfare of our communities. We'll be in Jeremiah 29, and we'll be looking at the first 14 verses. And so in verses 1 through 3, we're just going to see uh, history in two different layers. In verses 3 through 7, we're going to see a reminder of the creation mandate. In verses 8 and 9, we're going to see uh, uh, no endorsement. And then in verses 10 through 14, we're going to see future implications. Let me pray one more time, then we'll jump in. So Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is timeless and that it molds us. And yet it is timely and it awakens us. And so would you do both of those things this morning? Would you shape us in a way that goes beyond just our moment? But would you also awaken us to our moment? It is in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 1, would say this. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining exiled elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah, which in a moment you're going to see his name in a different way, Jehoiakim, but for now, just see it that way, the queen mother, the court officials, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metalsmiths had left Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elisa, son of Saphan, and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, as you read this, it's really just a short summary of something that you've actually already seen in history. Let me, let me say this. It wasn't until actually in my 30s, when I was, I, I was in a story of scripture class, that I recognize that some of what we're reading in the scripture between the history and the prophets are actually overlapping. And so I had grown up reading the Bible primarily in a devotional way where uh, whatever I was told to read that day by whatever thing that I was following along. And so one day I might be in Genesis and the next day I might be in Amos. Like I, I'd never learned to read the scripture fully in its context. And so when I was reading through the scripture consecutively growing up, I often was like, Jesus, you need to come get your people. Like they just were in exile for being idolatrous in Kings. And now I'm reading Jeremiah and they're doing the same stuff all over again. What is wrong with them? Come get your folks, Jesus. I had no idea that those things were happening concurrently. And I actually think that tension is kind of good. Because I do think there is a understanding of the scriptures in its history and that these things are happening at the same time. That's important. But it's also important for us to recognize yeah, some of the same problems that they were having in the book of Kings are some of the same problems that the prophets still need to warn us about. But specifically to this text, what we're reading actually comes out of 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. And so just to give you a kind of brief thumbnail flyover of the history of Israel, and so Israel becomes a nation when they leave, the, when they leave Egypt, the book of Exodus, and then they wander, ultimately get to the promised land, don't get rid of their enemies. We saw a few weeks back that um, they had judges that were helping to govern them, and then finally they be begged the Lord, we need to have a king like everybody else. The Lord gives them Saul. They begin to consolidate as a people, and finally when David, after Saul, becomes the second king, they eventually get into Jerusalem and eventually become this nation state that is stabilized. And kind of like reading Genesis chapter one and two, by the time you get to the third chapter, or by the time we get to the third king, things start to go wrong. Because Solomon is this wise king and the highlight of Solomon is early on when he goes before the Lord and he begs the Lord for wisdom and the Lord gives him wisdom and then he begins to build a temple that honors the Lord and though that's the high point and it just kind of goes downhill from there. He begins to marry uh, foreign, foreign nations, the daughters of kings, and so that way they could build political alliances. And in building those political alliances, he begins to adopt their gods, and they begin to worship their gods. And then it's just one generation later where his son ends up being a fool, overtaxing the people, and Re Jeroboam, and then Rehoboam splits off, and they start a completely different kingdom. And now there's a north kingdom and a south kingdom, and it's just downhill from there. There's something like 20 kings in each of those kingdoms. And if you look at the northern kingdom, they are 0 for 20. That is a bad day at the free throw line if you can't accidentally find a good king. And then the southern kingdom has something like eight kings that are good. And so that's still not awesome. We're shooting 40% here. Like they, we do not have good kings. 
And over and over again, they continue to get themselves in trouble. And you see early on in Kings that they, when I say Kings, I'm thinking first and second Kings. You see early, fairly early on in second Kings, after you see the prophets beginning to give warnings that um, the northern kingdom goes into exile. But then it's not till chapter 24 that the southern king goes into exile. Jehoiakim or Jokaniah, same person. His father, Jehoiakim, was unfaithful to the Lord. And the way that he was allowing sin and participating in sin and the bloodshed of the innocent and, and the, the vulnerable being victimized by the injustice of, of that day and age, it made it very clear that this was one of those kings that was part of the, the misses, the, the lack of faithfulness. So after his father becomes a, a vassal or a servant or a slave to Nebuchadnezzar for three years. He rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. He passes on the throne to his son, Jehoiakim. And when Jehoiakim comes king, um, here's what happens. Second Kings chapter 24, verse 8. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. I'm going to read more to you than what you're going to see on the screens. And he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His, mother na- his mother's name was Nehusta, daughter of Anathiah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. So you're already getting a context for who he is and what he does. And then verse 11 would say this, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city while his servants were besieging it. King Jehoiakim of Judah, along with his mother, his servants and his commanders and his officials, surrendered to the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. And so I want you to even hear the language around that. It's not that Nebuchadnezzar came in, like killed him and took over the kingdom. It's when the threat came to his front door, he was like, hmm, I'm going to live to fight another day. And he surrendered. And so what Jeremiah is telling them is at the same time in history when this has just happened and he's letting them know, okay, the Lord has a message for you. And in fact, if you read Jeremiah 29, it's actually three different letters, three different statements from the Lord. And this is the first and most profound or the the longest one where he's beginning to proclaim to them, hey, now that you find yourself in exile, what are we going to do with this? That's one layer of history that I want you to see, but there's a second, uh, maybe more meta layer of history that I don't want you to miss. That this narrative of unfaithful people going into exile is not just a moment in history that happens in 579 B.C., That actually the biblical story over and over again keeps pointing us to these pictures of people being not at home, being exiled, being far from the promises that they thought they were going to receive. And so if you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get the, I get the Northern Kingdom thing. You mentioned that. Or maybe you're like, yeah, 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 I get it. Like there's that, the story of Exodus. Like we spent a lot of time last year talking about people who were under siege, even though that was God's provision for them at the same time. But I want to go back farther than that. Because the story of the Bible starts with people in a garden, in a promised place with God. And that when they are sinful, what happens to them is they are removed from the garden or exiled from the garden. And then if you were just to read the first 11 chapters of the Bible, you begin to see this get progressively worse and progressively darker and progressively more depraved until you get to chapter 11, where right after this table of nations, the explanation of the table of nations is that here's what's happened. These people have showed up and tried to build their own place of glory, this Babel, if you will. And so this picture of exile from the place of God's presence to going to a place like Babylon or going to a place like Babel, where now you are under the thumb of of rulers who think that they're going to build the world under their own command and assume their own glory is not just the story that Jeremiah is trying to tell of those who are under Jehoiakim. It is the story of the human condition that over and over again, that we feel this angst because we're not quite at home. And the Tower of Babel is just a shadow over us day after day. And the reason I know that that's the story of the human condition is because you feel that. The number of meetings that I had just this week that of people who are sick of the world being broken, of sick of their home being broken, sick of their job being broken, sick of the political fray, sick of the, all the things that are going around them, saying there's got to be something better than this. And it's not that they're going to move to another zip code and things are going to be okay. We live in the shadow of a broken world that feels like Babylon all around us. And we are all longing for our true home. I wrote it this way. 
The story of the scriptures identifies exile as something more profound than a location problem. Exile is not just that you don't live where you want to live. Because some of y'all are like, man, I'd really like to move to PV. You'd still be in exile there too. We are all longing for home. So Jeremiah has introduced us to the context of when he's writing the letter, but what does the letter actually say? Verse three, let's say this. The letter stated, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have have deported you to. Pray to the God, or pray to the Lord, excuse me, on its behalf. For when it thrives, you will thrive. Now, I just, I want to, I want to think through this. Let me just be really vulnerable in front of you. When I pray about my enemies, I'm not praying out of Corinthians with the God of all comfort. Help them. When I pray about my enemies, I'm not with Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Help my enemies. But I might be like the Lord God of armies. You need to bring all of them chariots, horses, fire, whatever you got, and show up on their front step. Just let them, you don't even have to touch them, just let them know. Give them a little bit of that little revelation, Megiddo, where you just open your mouth, a sword comes out in the battle. Just give them a little bit of that. And so there's, it's a very clear, this title means something. In fact, a friend of mine uh, invited me to read a book earlier this year on prayer called In God's Presence, and it talks about that when you approach the Lord, you approach him in one of two ways, either a king in whom you work for, that you need him to give you what you need to uh, accomplish your assignment, or you come to him as a father, asking him to give you what you need because of his affection for you. But this is not that title. This is the title that when you see the enemy army coming up over the hill, you say, Lord God of armies, or, or the way the other versions of the text was like, Lord God of hosts, because that feels like it got something behind it. Lord God of hosts, I need you to deal with them. And so this is how he introduces himself. I, the Lord God of hosts, am saying to you right now. And so now, wait a minute. That sounds like you're about to say some gangster stuff. Like if nothing else, you're trying to remind me that this didn't catch you off guard, that Nebuchadnezzar's technology wasn't better than your technology and he caught you slipping, but instead that you're saying, hey, I'm still in control of this. There's no one that can overcome me. There's no power that's greater than me. I'm still the Lord God of armies. And what I'm about to command you as the commander in chief is to build houses. I don't know what kind of military strategy that is. You want me to build houses and plant gardens and eat their produce? What are we doing? Lord, you know me. I can't garden. I'm already disqualified. But like, what is, what is your message here? That in the middle of a place that I don't want to be in, and don't miss what he says, the Lord God of armies, and I deported you. I sent you here. I placed you in this place. I know you wouldn't have signed up to come to Babylon, but I sent you here. And now that you're here, here's what I'm telling you to do, to build, to invest. I'm talking about get married. Some of you who are single are like, yes, Lord. I was single once too. I love those texts. Marry off your kids, have grandkids. Like what kind of overcoming conquering strategy is this? Well, maybe it's not a geopolitical overcoming conquering strategy, but it is literally the oldest play in the book. 
If you go back to Genesis chapter one, um, God is creating over the six days. And on the sixth day, when he creates man, he says, hey, here's what I need you to do. It says that in 1, 26 and 27, that he created them in his image, male and female, he created them. And then he said to them, now be fruitful and multiply. And this language is fruitful and multiplying language. Go build a house. Well, maybe you need somewhere to live, but also understand the context of what's happening. They are not slaves without rights in exile. They have a prerogative of building something in exile. They're more near to us than what we realize. And then he would say, plant gardens. As if to say, hey, that that cultivating mandate that I gave you all the way back with Adam, I'm still saying the same thing to you. I know the location's different. I know it's not Eden. I know there's not four rivers. I know that there's not all the trees. But what I'm saying to you is that's lacking here and I put you here to build it. And then he would go a step further. He'd be like, and multiply your family. Have grandkids here. This is restating what the original mandate for humanity was in a place where most of us wouldn't want to do it. And then he goes on and says, not only that, but pursue the well-being of the city I've deported you to. Just in case you forgot, I put you here. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you thrive. Now, this too is not brand new language. There's a man named Abram, and Abram falls right after the scene of the Tower of Babel. And the first thing that Abram is told to do is that Abram is told to depart from the place where his family is. And here's what God's going to do, that he's going to, he's going to multiply him, that he's going to make a nation out of him, that he's going to make him fruitful. And so Genesis chapter 12, 12, verses one through three would say this. The Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So if if you thrive, they thrive. If they thrive, you thrive. Like there's this connectedness to your welfare. Um, Thrive, maybe not the word that we use often around here, but there is a word that we use for this called flourishing. That there's this contending before the Lord, praying, okay, Lord, would you bring flourishing to the people around me? Yes, the people who took me into captivity. Yes, the people who stole our stuff. Yes, the people who have occupied our home and destroyed our temple. Yes, would you bring flourishing to them? This is not just, you think differently than I do on issues. This is, you're my actual enemy who's causing damage in my life. And yet the Lord says that you pray for the welfare of the city. So I wrote it this way. The role of God's people is to bring peace in the midst of captivity, flourishing in the midst of chaos. You guys know this about me, that the Lord has um, given me opportunities to, to speak outside of this place periodically, whether that's camps or, or, or church events or mission conferences. Um, and and I, I get invited to a lot of stuff, but I don't get invited to, back to a lot of things. <laughs> and, I, and I think the reason is because I say things like what I'm about to say. I am allergic to the fragile minority mentality that says the world is so hard, we should hunker down and wait till Jesus does something. I just don't think that's the gospel. And so I'll be in settings where uh, I was in one not too long ago where there was a a bunch of people and it was a civic event and they were beginning to pray and they were praying about how hard our moment is and how difficult things are. And and when it was my turn to get up and pray, I I, I prayed, but I really preached a mini sermon. Um, And so I just just talked about that every time God wanted to do something that he would call people into this level of chaos. And when they entered into that level of chaos, they would begin to form things. And when they formed things, it caused flourishing. And so Lord, would you open our eyes to what you're calling us into that we might form the environment around us and that we might bring flourishing to it. They they did not invite me back. And I just want you to hear directly from me that there's something going on here in the midst of this exile that doesn't say to the people, just wait and maybe somebody better than Nebuchadnezzar is going to get elected. 
that it's in the midst of Nebuchadnezzar's reign that you still stand and be who you're called to be and not just bring flourishing for yourself, but bring flourishing even for those that would oppose you. And then verses eight and nine, for this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them for they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. I mean, I'm just telling you all types of things about me. I, I, I'm a cheap individual. And so I don't have live TV all the time. I only have live TV around the holidays. Start of the NBA playoffs, Christmas, start of the NBA season. So we had live TV this week. So we're watching live TV, trying to indoctrinate my son into be a Lakers fan. And the thing is, we don't, we don't usually watch commercials because we don't have live TV. And so, first of all, it's Halloween season, so I'm like, you can't watch that. Don't look at that commercial. You are never watching that movie. But then it's also all of the political campaign commercials. And so if you've ever been blessed to watch one of these, and by blessed, I mean, <laughs> what if I was being serious there? At the end of the commercial, it'll say, I am so-and-so, and I endorse this message. This seems like in verses 8 and 9, the Lord's like, I am the Lord God of armies, and I do not endorse this message. Look, look at the language that he uses. He says, don't let your prophets and your diviners deceive you. Like he's literally saying, they ain't from me. I don't know who they are, but they're not mine. They are amongst you. He would literally, that language of diviners, that's not typically how you would read religious personnel from the, from the tribe of, or from the people of God. They're not called diviners. Diviners are usually using dark magic to try and discern things. And so this means either one of two things. It either means that these people have always existed and have never been thought of to be religious voices. And all of a sudden they've become that now that they're in exile. Or they weren't that until they got up in Babylon and decided they're going to act like the Babylonians do. But somehow they're not reflecting what God would have called them to be. He said, they are not mine. I do not endorse this message. And then he would say, but I'll tell you who does endorse this message. Do not listen to the dreams you elicit from them. They're telling you what you want. They're communicating to you what you want to hear. They're speaking the things that you are trying to be comforted by. And that's not the message for me at all. And I just want to warn us, don't surround yourself with an echo chamber that just tells you what you want to hear. It can be really easy. Uh, if you ever look at my social media, you can see lots of basketball, lots of cooking, lots of creative design. And that wasn't because Instagram broke into my mind and said, he really likes these things. Let me just start putting them in his feed. I enjoy them and I like them and I watch them. So like, oh, you like that? We'll give you a little bit more. You like that? We'll give you a little bit more. You like that? We'll give you a little bit more. And so what I'm exposed to is curated by what I respond to. And can I just tell you what you're exposed to is curated by what you respond to. And so if all that's coming into your mind all the time is that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you're just going to keep doom strolling and hearing more and more of that. If all you're getting is one side of the political aisle telling you that this is the way that the world is and how everybody else thinks is a problem, you're just going to keep feeding off of that. You're just going to keep getting more of that. And I'm just going to tell you, it's really difficult to hear the voice of God clearly when you surround yourself with a curated echo chamber. If all you hear are the voices that are just speaking to you, the things that you want to hear, what God would say is, that ain't from me. And so then you make the other side of the aisle or the other side of the world or people who think different than you, you make them the boogeyman because you've never actually seen them as real people. You've seen them as voices that the voices you curated say is everything to be avoided as opposed to people who are made in the image of God who may differ than, than you on an opinion about a topic, but that doesn't make them evil. Tom, you are in a strong minority right now all by yourself. <laughs> And then when you move to verses 10 through 14, the Lord would say this, 
For this is what the Lord says. This is in contrast. I didn't say any of what you're hearing about. You're going to get out of here soon. He didn't say, I didn't say anything about that this is going to be a sh- short term. And so you're going to only have to endure this for a moment. Like he's talking to them about growing trees. You know how long it takes to grow a tree? This is not a short term stay. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the, Lord declara- the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. Now, before I even talk to you about what he says, I just want you to recognize how many times in just five verses he says, this is the Lord's declaration. Like, don't be confused by all that other stuff. This is actually what the Lord is saying. And then he says to them, when 70 years have passed, did a little research today. The, the, lar- the longest life expectancy on average for a nation of people is 85.63 years. It's the nation of Hong Kong. The United States life expectancy is 79.63 years. So if you were a nine-year-old who went into exile in Babylon, you ain't coming out of this thing, homie. You're just not. This is somebody's lifetime. This is very contrary news to what the false prophets were saying. The false prophets were like, hey man, you don't need to build a house. You don't need to plant a tree. You ain't going to see it. Lord's like, you're going to see it. And your kids are going to see it. And your grandkids are probably going to see it. We're going to be here for a while. And so, man, I'd be depressed if the message was, verse 10, when 70 years are complete in Babylon, full stop. Like, wait a minute, what? But verses 10 and verses 14 speak to something that, are the, that frame the, the center of what the Lord's trying to communicate to them. In 70 years... I'll restore you to this place. And so remember the start of the letter. The start of the letter is a message from Jerusalem to, or from Babylon to Jerusalem. The, the, this place is Jerusalem. For I know the plans that I have for you. And he begins to lay out what those plans are. And then you drop down to 14 and he says it again. Like, hear the declaration. I will restore your fortunes. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where you're banished. Like, I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. Like, I will take you home. Like, you can believe me in that. But in, the, in between, when I've told you to build and to plant and to multiply and to be a blessing and to pray for the thriving, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get me. Here's what's going to happen in the midst of that is that you're going to call out to me and I'm going to hear you. Like, here's what's going to happen. And, and I, know, I know Jeremiah 29, 11 um, has unfortunately been taken out of context. And so there are a lot of young adults that I walked around with that had tattoos, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans you have for me. I'm like, are you going into exile? <laughs> and I don't want to miss the reality of the text, it's not that the Lord doesn't have a good plan. It's not that the Lord won't bless you, but it is that he's calling that out to them in the middle of an exile that they don't want to be in. That he's saying things to them like, like when, I, when I pray, when you pray, I'm going to hear you. And they've just been through a season where it's like, hey, Lord, we really don't want this. And they ended up in exile. He says to them, you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Now we got a problem. Because my heart is deceitful and I can't even know it, much less control it. Like, how do I get to that point? And don't, don't, don't give me promises that I can't do. 
Don't say to me that you're gonna restore to me that I'm gonna go back home. All I have to do is figure out how to seek you with all of my heart. And we talk about how the bad free throw percentages of all the Northern Kings, you know how many days I've been able to seek the Lord with all my heart? I can't do math on that level, but my percentage ain't good. And so what what does that mean? I mentioned to you before that much of our scriptures are happening in a very concurrent way. And one of those things that's happening is at the same time that this is happening and Jeremiah is sharing this, there is a prophet in Babylon named Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is just as clearly speaking to the brokenness of his people as Jeremiah is. They're both talking about the idolatry amongst the people and the way that they've um, almost been like an adulterous lover under the Lord, like they've just been unfaithful to him. He's talking about the injustices that the the leaders are allowing to happen. He sees the brokenness just as easily as Jeremiah does. But in in chapter 36, he, he says this, "'For I will take you from the nations "'and gather you from all the countries.'" and will bring you into your own land. Also sprinkle, you, uh, also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. You will live in the land and I will, uh, that I gave your answers, uh, ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. So if you are feeling a little um, concerned about, I can't do what you're asking me to do, the Lord's response is, but I can, I'll give you a new heart. That if you're like, my, my old heart is calcified and divided and broken, um, Ezekiel would be saying at the same time that Jeremiah is saying, God wants you to seek him with all of his heart. Jer- uh, Ezekiel on the same time is saying, and he's going to give you a new one so you can do it. Yeah. That not only will you seek me and find me, but I'm going to give you the means in which to seek me faithfully. So what do we do with that? I said it before that followers of Jesus must find the balance between rebellion and concession as we seek the welfare of our communities. I just have one point. Whether we like it or not, you and I are living in exile, and therefore we are called to cultivate flourishing. This is not just an Old Testament thing, but it's a New Testament thing. Do you realize that everything that's written to you in the New Testament is written primarily to people who live under an occupying nation that treats them like they're not citizens in their own homes? And so when Jesus shows up and starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. He's saying it to people who are in exile. When Jesus says that if somebody wants you to walk a mile with them, walk two, he's not talking about getting your steps in so you can close your ring on your watch. He's talking to people who are occupied under Roman imperial power and a Roman soldier could come to them and say, hey, you need to carry my bags for a mile. And he says, you go one one mile further to show your self-giving love to them. That when... When Paul would write that um, you need to obey your government leaders, he's not writing that saying, because your guy or your gal won the election, get excited. When Peter writes to the elect exiles in the five cities in Asia, and he's writing to them, and what he's saying to them when he says, hey, you honor the emperor, he's, he's writing to people who very clearly are not at home. When the book of Revelation tries to instill this hope in you about what is to come, like what's being written to these letters to these churches that are meant to represent all the churches of all time is that these are occupied people under the specter of Babylon, which is any empire that because of power and wealth will step on anybody they need to neck to exalt itself, that they live under that. And yet he puts their hope in the king and tells them to live faithfully. And you and I are called to do the same. So if you're asking the question, what's my civic duty in the moment that I live in? Your civic duty 
is to contend for the welfare of the city and the culture around you. And you're like, well, make that a little bit more practical for me. Okay, I will. If it means that you vote on November 5th, it means you vote. But it means you don't vote looking at the ballot saying, what's best for me? You vote in a, the most selfless, life-giving, lo- loving, sacrificial way that you possibly can. I was at lunch with a man this week, and I said, I, I think our forefathers were brilliant when they thought of a two-party system, but I wish that policy wasn't tied to person. I wish we could go in the ballot box and say, um, I care about the sanctity of life. I, I care about people being defended from guns because that's the same issue for me. Um, I care about the rights of women and the rights of babies. I care about this. I, I care about this. I care about this. Now elect for me somebody that will do that as opposed to a policy being trapped under the personality of a person who is trying to win a contest. And so when you step into the booth to vote, you are not the primary interest. You are a conduit of God's grace and mercy in the world that you live in. You build gardens. You build houses. You do what would create flourishing in the world around you because when they flourish, you flourish. And then all of the other normative things that you do because here is the the radical foolishness that we live in. That suddenly we have civic duty but it only happens once every four years when we vote for this one thing. You actually have a a civic duty every single day. In every space that you enter into, you are these exiles that are living for the kingdom and bringing that type of flourishing into every place that you enter into, that you bring the formation in the middle of the chaos, that you bring the flourishing in the middle of the chaos, that you bring the peace when it feels like it's a time of war, that that's what you're called to do. And so whatever it is that you're gifted to do, do that thing. If you're gifted to teach, go teach. If you're gifted to coach kids in sports, go coach kids in sports. If you're gifted to run business, go run a business. If you're gifted to be a good neighbor, be a good neighbor. Whatever it is that the Lord has given you the grace to do, do that in a way that brings flourishing to the city, that brings longevity and legacy and fruitfulness. You go be those who live out the creation mandate in the world around them and don't wait for a ballot to give you a permission to do it. Enter in with what the Lord has given you. And to God, quit vacating spaces because they're difficult. He called you into them. You bring his flourishing. Let's pray. So Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that if the story of the scriptures is that the human condition is that we are longing for a home that we can't get to, that the message of Jeremiah 29 is not when you do enough right sacrifices and when you find a way to claw your way back out of occupation and get yourself back home, I'll meet you there. But that in the middle of exile, that you are giving us new hearts because you're showing up and you're being with us. In fact, if I, if I had time, I would read through Ezekiel 47 where there's this picture of a new temple that's built and, and, and instead of the presence flowing into the temple, it's flowing out of the temple, causing new life everywhere it goes. And so you will be amongst us, but you're not staying just in the safe places. You're flowing into the dry desert places and bringing life there also. That's not just about water. It's about the movement of your people. Move us in that way. Would we not be so preconditioned to play the playbook of the empire. But instead, would we live like exiles with agency to bring kingdom flourishing into every desert we step into? It's in your matchless name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for checking out this message from Kings Harbor. We would love to connect with you. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello and fill out a short connect card, that allows us the opportunity to follow up with you. Also, if this message has been a blessing to your life, we believe that the Lord wants to rule and reign in every part of who we are. That means our time, our talent, our treasure. And so if, if this has been a blessing, we would ask that you would consider contributing back to the ministries of Kings Harbor so we can continue to bless and help people in the same way that we hope we have done for you. 
With that in mind, we want you to know that our heart towards you and our heart towards the world around us is that we want to be a love-forward people. And we're praying that you would join us in that.